And they get the text again, meet seven o'clock in the morning in the changing room. They're like, all right, we're going to get bollocked again. They got there seven o'clock in the morning. Everybody gets dressed in their full training kit and there's 500 beers. He puts the music on. He's like, all right, lock the doors now. If you, you finish those beers, then you can go home. Um, coaches as well. Coaching in France is something that is often criticized over here in England. We, they speak about it's not as detailed as, as it is over here. That may be a myth that, that we want to dispel or it may be, it may be true. But specifically the coaches that you've played under, who are the, who are the best coaches you've played under? Who are the worst coaches you've played under? Name names, you're both retired, now you can do that. And, and kind of what makes them good and bad? Um, I actually, I had to go deep into that um, not so long ago. And the best coach that I ever had would probably be sort of a mix of the different angles of you know, what, you, what you come across. I think there's some incredible stories about Franck Azemasso has been my coach in, 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 in Clermont and he's just a very human person. He connects with you on a human basis. I always felt because towards the end of my career, I, 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 I wasn't looking so much at the human. I was more looking at the, 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 the efficiency, how good. And I want to, it's the English teacher who makes a spelling mistake on the board. That's done for me. I will never respect them for them. I want somebody to actually teach me something or to be so charismatic that I'll be blown away. Whereas when I was young, you didn't see so much the tactic, the technique. You just wanted almost a father figure, you know, with somebody to reassure you, to help you, to, um, to let you grow. So the humanity of Franck Azema, I think, is a, he's just a fantastic bloke deep down in, in his core. Um, Vern Cotter was a dictator for, t- for six or seven years in, in France and then obviously for Scotland. But then the 2010 year where they won it with Clermont, he used to bat- batter the shit out of boys the day after you lose a, a game. So it was like, you get a text, welcome, seven o'clock in the morning, you know, they would run the hills, do full on contact. You know how it's like a punishment. So it works once, it works twice, but it doesn't look at, it work in the long run because that's unsustainable. And they lost a quarter final. I don't know if you remember, a quarter final of Champions Cup uh, in Leinster by like one point and Brock James misses like 16 points by kicking three drop goals two penalties whatever the headline was like Calamity Jane uh, the next day and um, and they get the text again meet 7 o'clock in the morning in the changing room they're like alright we're gonna get bollocked again they got there 7 o'clock in the morning everybody gets dressed in their full training kit and there's 500 beers he puts the music on he's like alright lock the doors now if you, you finish those beers, then you can go home. And they spend the day laughing, sharing stories, obviously getting absolutely shit-faced. But just, just living together, that year they won it. They, just, they did four years, four consecutive top 14 final in, in a row. Same cats and same coach, relatively same groups. Do you know how hard that is to wake up? You're Aurélien Rougerie, a legend of French rugby. He's got nothing to prove to anyone. But you're captain one year, you lose. Okay, well, I'll get back on the horse. Second year, you lose again. Oh, get back on. Third year, you lose again. What the hell are you going to tell your boys on the Monday? Oh, let's go again. Yeah, we'll win it this year. You know, it's, it's hard to motivate guys. And he got them by pivoting. So he was a, he was a dicta- dictator who sensed that his, his team needed something else from him. And boom. And he went. To it. So I, I had a lot of respect for that. He knew how to adapt his management. Uh, he was good to me because instead of saying, you need to earn my trust, he signed me and he said, I will give you all my trust now. It's you not to let it go. Because I was sort of the hot thing when I was in Leicester. And then I came, went back to Stade. That's a different story. I'll tell you about it later. But it wasn't a good idea. And so my, you know how your profile sort of goes? I wasn't in the French team anymore. And I got contacted by Clermont all those consecutive years. When I was in Leicester, when I was in Stade, when I was in Cast. And there, his speech, Vern's speech, never changed. His approach was always the same. So like, no, no. It's like, I don't care about how well you're playing now. I know how good you can be. And that was precisely what I needed in my career. And that's why it, it hit off straight away. So... Pivoting, humanity, and then there's lo- loads of other coaches, but I'll, I'll, I'll stay to that now. Johnny? We obviously lost a lot more than you with Vern, but we never had the 500 beer story, so I'm gutted that that's the first <laughs> thing you've led with. That never happened to us. <laughs> 100% the best coach technically and the most gifted guy that I ever worked with was Fabian Galtier, but he was also the hardest guy to work for. So you touched on the human effect. Again, that's something that's talked about massively in France is coaching with uh, an effective side. I'm not sure how you translate that into English. You're affective. Your effect that you can have on people. And it's hugely important how you control a group, how you control respect, and how you motivate people. In British or Anglo culture, it's not the same. You, you set out a game plan, you get everybody working for the organization, and you just kind of roll it out. Whereas in France, it's more how can you mediate your structure and your technical with actually how can we get everyone on board 
not have any fights and keep everyone's morale high. That is more of a primary shift, I feel, in France is how you look after people, especially the French side. It can sometimes be different with foreigners. But Fabian, and coupled with um, Mario Ledesma, that was the team at the time, really good coaching team. The detail was unbelievable. It was the best rugby I ever got to play. It was because of them and the way that we played the game in Montpellier for two years. But in terms of working with them, it was unbelievably hard. The way they would talk to people, the disrespect, the derogatory comments, the bullying every day, it really, really was tough. The son, I remember a guy, you'll know him, Benji, Vincent Pello, Vincent Pello, who at the time was a young tight head coming through. We're doing scrummaging practice and he was struggling. He's now, you know, played tests for France on a loose head. He kills it every week for La Rochelle and he's a good guy. I remember doing scrummaging practice and Mario would just lean, just pretend there's a cheeseburger behind the scrum. Go and fetch it, you fat ass. That was how he would try and motivate people. He would just bully people. And you, the whole scrum, we're packing down, we'd go, oh, not again. You know, that kind of stuff on a regular basis or, you know, pulling people by the ears. Come here, you fat pig, get into place. This is where I told you to go. Like the, the language and the way they spoke to you in any other country it wouldn't fly. But because you were there and then and it was France and you were trying to make it work, it worked. So... A real mix, some superbly talented coaches, some really bad ones as well. Probably the most anglified coach I worked with was Christoph Urios, who did really well with, obviously, Oyanax, Cast, and then uh, Bordeaux. They were leading the top 14 last year. And he's a guy I think we could look out for this year. Again, have, after having led the top 14 last year, doing a really good job with Bordeaux this season. Um, really structured, really into his culture, driving people, getting people to bond with their town. Um, and he has a good template if I had to play as well. Super organized and efficient guy. So he's definitely one to look out for this season. And I think a lot of people will be surprised about those stories about Fabian Galtier, Johnny, because obviously he is the current France coach. So I mean, do you think he's changed? Do you think he's mellowed or is he still the same guy? No. I mean, I had him in 2012, 2014. I mean, Benji, you had him when you were a young kid as well at Stade Francais. I think I'm right in saying, but... I mean, there were stories that we heard from when he was at Stade Francais that were the worst, if not the same. There's a guy as well, like at the World Cup, refused to play the third, fourth playoff when he was a player. After losing the semi, he was like, I'm not playing in this third, fourth. And he flew home. Just It was about him. He wanted to be the best. And, and that was it. So, look, fundamentally, he is a top-class coach. He, I've said before, he, he's the best coach that I've worked with from a technical perspective. But there are like personality traits that hold him back. And if he could fix them, he would be, he'd be one of the best in the world, 100%. And um, Benji, you have stories from Stade Francais. I mean, there's even things from, like, to, to give you an example, we had a player who'd re-signed a contract at Montpellier with uh, Moed Altrad, a three-year contract, a good sum of money. He'd been playing really well, but Fabian hadn't okayed it. And just to prove he was the boss, he said, I refuse to have that guy. It wasn't me that okayed it. Pay him out. And that was it. The week later, the guy that had signed his contract had three years of money arrive in a check in his bank account because Fabian was the boss and he's the one that had the last same recruitment. Just to prove that point, the guy had to go and find another club, I think, sometime in July. So there's a long history of stories, um, very, very different in levels of energy um, that get pumped up. But he's, he's an amazing coach, um, a very, very smart man as well. Um, but there's some stories that would um, leave a very bad taste in your mind. Did you get Did you get a similar impression, Benjamin? At Stade Francais. To be fair, so it's a bit complicated for me to comment on that one because I, I think what Johnny says is, is 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 pretty true. But he was my first coach. I mean, I had Nick Mallet when I first arrived in 2003, but I, I played one game on the bench, and then he was my first coach to actually give me a shot. Um, he trusted me like nobody ever did. Uh, he really gave me, he, 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 cause you can say whatever you want about him. He is ballsy. He's got nuts of steel. Uh, he backs yeah. himself and he's got great strategy and stuff, but I'll give you an example. So he chucked me um, when I was 19, 20, a semifinal in Bordeaux against Toulouse, who at the time were killing everyone. And remember the, that Charbon Delmas, the, the Bordeaux pitch, where there's a long tunnel to go through. So you just, you walk for a long, long time. Yeah. And he stood behind me the whole tunnel and he was just whispering stuff in my ear, you know, do this, do that, da, 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 da. literally helping me. I was so focused. I didn't really listen to what he was saying. Fair enough. You know, he's the coach. I'm like, I'm not going to tell him to fuck off. So I'm walking down and stuff and we, I play really well and we win and I'm, on, I'm sky high. And at, the, and at the end of the game, I shake his hand. The first thing he says to me is like, and he comes with a, he likes to, you know, to play like poker face all the time. He, he's never, really, he games. likes to, to, yeah. And he, he like, um, he p puts you off all the time. You know, you're expecting him to give him a big hobby and then he stops and went, let this start. 
you're not going to say thank you? I said, what do you mean? Did you see how much I helped you in the tunnel? Pretty much gave you that game, didn't I? <laughs> I was like, yeah, thank you. He just wanted me to say thank you. And I'm 20. So I'm saying, thank you, Fabian. You know, <laughs> I'm not really standing up for myself. But at the same time, he trusted me like nobody else. And he really did help me. And everything that he told me was true. What, what, what I worked on worked. And, and he's the only coach that I ever met that on Tuesday, he's like, hang on. So this is what happened in designer. Okay, let's, let's go. Hang on. Let me think. All right, we're going to create this play. We're going to do this, this, that, 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 that. And on Saturday, you score. And we did. That's the only time that this ever happened to me. So he is a strategic and technical genius, not technical, strategic genius. Yeah. But I've seen him do stuff, not, not to me, but to others that were very, very tough. He, 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 he struggled with um, people who needed a human side. He struggles with people who are not as ruthless and hardcore as him, which is a trait of all the guys who are very, very driven, you know, and they a bit, not like Michael Jordan, last dance, but you know what I mean? That type of sort of angle. Uh, the only way is tough. The only way is like this. If you need the heart and the, the soul and stuff, that you can fuck off. But some guys do. And I think the best coaches need to recognize that there's 15 guys in the room and those 15 are incredible different human beings and they need to be handled differently. And he was a bit my way or the door, you know?